Well, hi there. Thanks for finding the Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas here on YouTube. If you want more, you can just go to any podcast channel and find the show or go to lucydumascoaching.com, Lucy with an I, to learn more about me and to listen to shows. And thank you for subscribing, sharing with your friends, and I hope you enjoy. Bye for now. I encourage all of you to seek out teachers and mentors that challenge you to think for yourself and guide you to find your own voice. That's a quote by Renee Olstead. And I want to welcome you again to the Profitable Photographer. I'm super excited to chat with our next guest. And the way we connected was sort of serendipity and then as we connected, then I was like, hey, I have a podcast idea. So you'll learn more about that. Just want to remind you that I do have a group coaching program that is designed to help you learn how to be an incredible salesperson in a way that doesn't feel salesy and your clients will enjoy and that will earn you thousands and thousands of dollars per client. So just go to Lucy Dumas Coaching. You'll see the classes tab. And there's also a gift you can find on a tab that says gifts. So that's enough of my shameless plug. So let me tell you about today's guest, George Allen. He was raised in Cleveland, Ohio, and opened a studio at 19. Then Monty Zucker hired him in 1987, and he went on to photograph 2,000 weddings over 28 years. 1996, he began to be an assistant with Bill McIntosh, and he travels all the time in the U.S. and the U.K. to teach portrait workshops and week-long seminars. So, George, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, Lucy. Thank you so much for this opportunity to chat with you. You know, I do listen to your podcast um, often, and I'm really excited to share with your listeners, you know, the power of mentoring. One-on-one -on -one coaching is very powerful. It's great stuff. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I forgot to read the rest of your bio. So in 2001, Mr. Cheris, we'll talk about why we call him Mr. Cheris. <gasps> called and offered an apprentice position in uh, Orange County and in Dallas, Texas. So uh, that's a very impressive list of people who you've worked for and with over your, let's see, 1987. So when did you start your studio? I started my studio in 1979. Okay. Yeah. That's when I first started getting the itch and had a 35 millimeter. I went to Europe in 1979 and took a lot of pretty great photos for somebody that didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> and then took me three more years to realize it was time to start a business. And I was a little older than 19. So that's impressive. All right. So what George and I want to talk about, because we were having the most fun, it seemed like it was in person, but it was through Facebook. We were chatting about some of the people that he's worked for that if you haven't heard of them, we're going to talk about them today. They are some of the most influential teachers that when I was a youngin and George was a youngin, they were the superstars. So we're going to talk about some of the lessons that he learned and I learned from some of the icons of our early years. And I'm super excited about that. Yes, I am too. <laughs> also, what you didn't have in your bio is that one of your claims to fame are some very cool Santa photos, that that's a division that you had in your own business. Is that right? Yes. Yes, Lucy. Um, about seven years ago, uh, I was intrigued by the Santa world coming into professional photography. You know, I mean, I I did some part-time mall Santa photos for uh, a large mall business here near my home. And it was basically a vehicle for me to 
find customers for my studio. So I was willing to give about 15 hours a week to this, you know, a mall Santa kind of business. But I made so many contacts and it was really a marketing idea rather than it was that. But I turned that from, you know, standing behind a camera and snapping photos every 30 seconds, and, you know, and moving on to learning uh, this fine art Santa business that we are seeing now in this country with Larry Hirschberger and Ted Lozinski and quite a, a few others. Um, and I got very intrigued by that. So I started, you know, studying that. And, um, mm-hmm. and I do offer that as well uh, for a couple of months in the fall. I don't do the full blown program like some of these other folks do where they start in July. Um, I really do just keep it to the fall. Um, but I'm really loving it. You know, I love photograph- photographing kids uh, and I love photographing them with Santa. And to do it in this method uh, is really a kick. Mm. And how is this different than mall Santa photos? Well, you know, again, the mall Santa is like a 30 second thing. Sit on the lap, take a picture, move on. Um, you know, this type of work that we do, uh, it's more of a storytelling. It's about a 30 to 40 minute session. I know some photographers go longer. We do about a 40 minute session and it's about five to six different scenes and themes with the children. We have milk and cookies with Santa. Santa will read a story. They will paint uh, a nutcracker or some toy. Um, and it's really an experience, mm. uh, a total experience with the kids. They're absolutely enthralled with this whole thing. And then at the end, Santa presents them with a gift. Now, oftentimes that gift is something that the parents will purchase and give to me on the sneak before the child arrives or on mm. a day. So it's a personalized gift from the parents that Santa gives to them. And then we create storybooks. Uh, wall art is very big on, in this type of work. And uh, it's it's awesome. I love it. Fun, fun. We have a nice, um, let's try something different kind of thing. So one other question before uh, we start going through my list, and you might have somebody that you want to bring in to this conversation as well. So when you were working with Monty and Bill McIntosh and Mr. Philip Cheris, did you have your own business on the side or was this full-time for for those great studios? Great question. Thank you. Yes. When I worked with Monty, I closed a studio that I had in Ohio and I moved to Maryland um, to take a full-time position with him. Mm. So at that point, for a 10-month period, I was an employee, strictly an employee of Monty Zucker and Monty uh, Studio uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland. Bill McIntosh it was a side business with Bill. I still had my, I started my full-time studio again uh, in 1991, which was two years after working with Monty. I had a short stint there where I was where I was ill. And then I returned back to Maryland and I opened my business again under George Allen Portraits. Okay. And at that time, I was a wedding studio. I did that full-time. I had a staff of three full-timers and 11 part-time. We would do as many as five weddings on a weekend. Um, And so we were quite busy doing the, uh, we did probably about 150 weddings a year for for a decade. Um, And by having those full-timers, it allowed me to start to pursue my other interests since I was all wedding for so long. And um, again, that came on board when I decided that Bill McIntosh was in town for a workshop, and I I had never met him. I had admired his work for a long period of time. He was strictly um, an environmental photographer, and he was known very well during those years as photographing all of our military leaders, which I learned later on once I met and worked with him, that he was aspired to do that from one of his previous people that he admired greatly, Yusuf Karsh. Mm. who photographed all the military leaders during the Second World War. Wow. So it really put a buzz in my ear that I had an opportunity to spend time with him because this is why mentoring, I believe, is so very important. We really need to look to the generations before us, uh, stand on their shoulders so that we can see further along. Right. And so many of them, even Mr. Cheris, uh, he started his business as a young child, or not a young child, but a young guy. Since you brought up Bill, I'd like to take some people one at a time. So Bill McIntosh 
So I'm familiar with him as well. Environmental portraiture is something he excelled at and he taught um, and he passed away just like a year. Last year. Yes. I'm friends with his daughter, Lori, mm-hmm. and I was sorry to hear that. Okay. So if you could say one really powerful thing that you learned from Bill, what would that be? Okay. Well, it's interesting that when I spent my two years with Bill, it was every week, a couple of days and some weeks for the full week. And of the mentors that I had and the people that I would seek out to learn from that really put a buzz in my ear. One thing I could say about Bill was after every session, and sometimes they were many hours long, because as you know, uh, and for the, those of you who don't know, please look him up. He was a photographer that used multiple lighting. I mean, it was very common that we would use four to seven lights. It would take an hour and a half to set up, plus your session. It's a three-hour session, one subject. We finish up, always in the car on the way back, without fail. He would always ask me, so what did you learn today? Mm. It was great. He wasn't just like using me or having me there to help. He was had total interest in helping me along with my career as well. And so he taught me almost like a dad. He yeah. really became like a second father to me. Yeah. He's such a nice man. So yeah. he used all those lights in an environment? Well, always indoors, but sometimes outdoors was minimum three. Yeah. Even outside, we would use three plus the sun. Yeah. Wow. So he really crafted his work. One thing you learned from him was to take each photo session and analyze what you learned from that. Yeah. He would ask me about, because again, Bill was the consummate professional as far as he had his his main points he must hit in every portrait which brought him to the level of excellence that he that he commanded Mm -hmm. he always he always made sure that he had composition color harmony and design and he would literally preach that to me that every photograph you create it must have composition color harmony and design and he taught me how to read light Indoors mm. and outdoors, to Great. the point to where when you view a Bill McIntosh portrait, it really does have a three-dimensional, almost you can touch it type of yes. look on a flat piece of paper. And yeah. that was just so mesmerizing to me. I, I never I can never get enough of that. Yeah. Okay. Composition, color, harmony, and design. Read the light and pay attention to what you've learned after each time. So mm-hmm. good stuff. All right. So I'm going to move on to somebody else before we go into Mr. Cheris, because there's a lot we can talk about with him. So you worked for Monty Zucker. So describe Monty's work for people. And he's been gone 10 years? Since 2007. Yeah, since 2007. So that's 15. Wow. Okay. So tell, tell us in a nutshell a little about Monty and his work. Wow, what can you say about Monty? He can go on and on. He was very eccentric. He was very full of energy all the time. Go, go, go. And he would oftentimes say, you know, when we go out to a wedding today, we're going to shoot for the moon and we'll always be among the stars. Mm. Always really, really pushed. Uh, probably more than anyone I've met. Um, mm-hmm. and, but in a good way, you know, certainly yes. in a good way. I mean, he commanded excellence and he had it, he had it down so well. Um, he taught me very much about how to launch and to grow a wedding business ah. through vendors and affiliates. Uh, just powerful stuff. And especially today's world with social media, where it's very easy to just post a few photos and move on, the interaction and phone calling and dropping in on businesses that are vendors, a part of weddings, is at least I, I feel has perhaps taken a backseat or, or has faded. It's extremely powerful. Mm-hmm use your vendors and your affiliates to grow your wedding business. I mean, in in my case, within two and a half years in a city that I wasn't raised in, I was booking 150 jobs a year Yeah, just from that process. So Monty was powerful in that way. Um, His work was excellent always. Um, He was very demanding. He would also take time after the event, the week after, to go through the slides. Back then it was slides, no paper, no computer too much. Um, and uh, to explain and to teach what he was doing, angles, lighting, and so on. Mm-hmm. 
So when I did weddings, George, I accidentally learned about the power of growing a business through vendors because I'm just a natural friend maker and networker. And I'm a person that if I like something, I tell others. Mm -hmm. And so I started making friends and giving referrals in the industry. And then they started sending work back. And then I started realizing, holy cow, this is a great way to grow my business. And also it was a great way to show up to a wedding and know that the DJ and the cake baker and the videographer and all of those people were going to be doing a great job and working with me instead of uh, one thing I find, I don't know if you agree with this, but weddings tend to attract people that like to control and be in charge. Bossy people. (laughs) Absolutely. I'm totally there. (laughs) So you get us all together anyway. So it was always great when a wedding had, most of my vendors because I could relax and not have to worry about them not kind of cooperating with my needs and me with them. Um, So yes on that. Now, so Monty, for people that are now um, thinking, I need to pull over and look up his work. He took, at least this is my understanding, the world of weddings pre-Monty was pretty stand up in front of the altar and and line up and photograph. And he started bringing, I'm sure there's someone he learned this from, but he started bringing a little mini studio and setting it up in like the church hall or some somewhere else. And a lot of the formals were actually studio portraits. And that's where he really crafted and taught a whole generation of photographers to be doing classic portraiture at weddings. And I don't know if this is what you saw, but you can command a lot more money when that's what you're showing when everybody else is doing just on camera flash on the altar kinds of things. Is that, am I on track? Is that how you'd describe his work? Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, um, just to throw this in quick, you know, we all have teachers. We all have mentors. Monty learned from Joe Zeltzman. Okay. Joe Zeltzman was a master poser and a very good photographer. And Monty learned from him and took it so much further than Joe had ever done. But again, it was a different time. But yes, Monty would take a six foot magenta green painted by Joe Petrosha. Yeah, who was as well made that background extremely popular all around the country. We, when I was with him, we probably I say we, but it was really him. He sold probably ten thousand of those things. It was crazy. Oh yeah, but, uh, but everybody wanted one, and he was able to take the studio to the wedding, and he would start a few to several hours before. It, it was very common that if the service was at two p.m., we were there at ten a.m. getting wow. ready. Wow, a very long day. He would oftentimes do the portraits, start the ceremony, and then I would finish the wedding. Mm. Uh, and there's always two to three people at a, a Monty wedding. Mm. Um, and so when I uh, started my business here in Maryland, we had teams of three that would attend a wedding, a photographer, wow. an assistant, and a coordinator. And uh, it makes very good customer service. Uh, it makes sure you don't miss anything, first of all, because you have three sets of eyes checking the same thing. But yeah, the Monty Green background, the magenta green background with Monty doing studio portraits uh, on a small little portable at the time. It was a Porter Master by Photogenic. Um, but, you know, lighting today can be done, you know, constant lights or strobes either way. But mm-hmm. It's a great way. I still do that when I do an occasional wedding. Yeah. Uh, I offer that. People come to me for that. It becomes your brand. It becomes your look and your, you know, your selling points, if you will. So I'm getting an idea. So for people that are thinking it's just too competitive with weddings these days, if someone shows up not to do a bunch of candids and, you know, getting ready shots and selling a pile of digitals from the whole day, but shows up with studio lighting, doing this kind of work, it's a great way to completely change the game in your community. And people will gravitate towards that the right people will love that so yeah now one thing (laughs) i'm not going to give examples but one thing i found was interesting with monty 
is he was like the top of the heap, right? By far. Speaker, yes. incredible. And yet there were many moments where I experienced him as a very insecure person. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I can see that. Because again, I spent full time with him for 10 months. And so, yeah. Yeah. And so the reason I'm bringing that up is not to be like, oh, well, he wasn't all that. But that even the best has, uh, get the grammar right on this. So if we compare our outsides to somebody's insides or someone's exterior success and quality, and he was so generous with sharing with what might be working inside, I'm not quite sure how it, if I'm saying this the way I want to, but we all have our doubts. We all have our insecurities, even the greats, and maybe even especially the greats. Do you have thoughts on that? Absolutely. Sure. Sure. And, you know, if you go back in history a bit too, you know, which again, going back to Bill McIntosh, he also taught me about the power and the importance of having a library. Uh, and, and if you go back to Van Gogh and some other painters, you know, they had a similar kind of personalities when you dig into who they were, but their work was incredible. Right, right. And I think sometimes that insecurity drives some people to get out there and actually give their gifts and be better at what they do. And, you know, someone that's just happy as a clam and knows their value and has no, you know, childhood issues or, you know, wherever this all comes from, you know, might just sit on their porch <laughs> playing with with babies and grandbabies. So, yeah, and I always found him. And because when I was new, I assumed that these teachers that we're talking about had it all together. And as I began to discover and get more in a personal level with, you know, the greats in our history, because you and I share the same decades, is that they were just people. And mm -hmm. It was reassuring to me that. Yes. Yeah. Now, quick, I never met him. Did you ever meet Rocky Gunn? No, unfortunately, I did not. I came a little after that. And Rocky Gunn was, again, a big inspiration on Monty, I understood. Monty would talk highly of him um, on numerous occasions when I was in his presence. Didn't meet Rocky Gunn. Yeah. I began to hear his name over and over and over again by these teachers that we're talking about and others that knew him. And now my understanding is his claim to fame was the dramatic outdoor portrait that he would take people to the beach and on rocks and things that are so exciting that a lot of newer photographers are doing now. So I love that everything old is new again. And when I get to heaven, if there's such a place and if there's a Rocky gun there, I'd like to meet him. <laughs> right. right. Okay. Let's talk about Big Daddy Don Blair. Did you meet him? Did you take classes with him? You know, that's interesting you ask because he's probably one of the only or maybe the only icon from my time that I didn't have an opportunity to meet. And I, I can't honestly say why that happened. I have no clue because he was good friends with Monty. Um, I even recall being at the studio and he and Monty would be on the phone talking together at times. Mm -hmm. um, but I never met Don. Great guy. I understand. Super nice. Um, and his education level was terrific. Again, yes. one of these one of these folks that really laid a path for us for generations. Oh, yes. So I'd heard his name and I was skiing in Utah. And his studio was in Salt Lake City. And it was raining and you can't ski in the rain. <laughs> it's just not good. And I realized we were having lunch or something for the day. And I thought, I wonder where Don Blair's studio is. And it happened to be close to where I was. So I just showed up and knocked on the door of his studio or, you know, walked in. And he was the most generous welcoming person I think I've ever met in this industry. And he brought us inside and he actually gave me, I mean, luckily he wasn't shooting, but I'm sure he would have been happy to have us 
watch or even assist if he did have a job. But he, he like, he gave me a little mini seminar. Like, uh-huh. here's how you light this. This is the lights I do here. Here's the hair light. And he had some unique lighting patterns and I can't remember it now. It might have been that that you put your main light and your fill light on the same side yes. so that the light wraps or it might have been feathering. Yes. I don't know. And then he lived to be almost 100. And when he was in his mobile scooter on the show floor of the expos, it was like the Pied Piper, his mm-hmm. warmth. He made you feel like, oh, there you are. I've missed you. And I'd only met him in person one time. Anyway, he was awesome. And I wish I had taken a week-long class with him. It would have been great. So another one of mine is um, Victor Avila. Did you know Victor? No, I did not have an opportunity to see, meet him either. So you know the name? Yes, I heard the name. So oh. he actually was from San Diego. Oh. And I think he grew up in Tijuana. Um, short, a little bit chubby, majorly flirty, intense energy. And his work was very simple, but so rich and textured with just like a couple of umbrellas. Um, With his personality, he managed to get personality from his subjects. And what he did for me in my career, because I'd heard of him when I was new, and I went to a bridal show. I set up a booth. There were 30 other photographers. I was like, oh, what am I doing here? Nobody's going to book me. I'd been in business uh, not quite three years. I hadn't joined our local PPA chapter. And he walked up and I'm like, oh, it's Victor. Victor, hello, I'm Lucy Dumas. And he stopped and he looked at my booth and he looked at me and he looked at my work and he said, who are you? Because with work like this, I can't believe I don't know who you are yet. And I saw him do that over and over again with people to make them feel like they've got something special. Mm -hmm. You know, some people like, no, he was just flirting with you because he was a big flirt. But no, he sincerely was generously passing on an observation that it boosted me from like a two to a nine in confidence that I had something and I had a place in this industry. So yeah, he, he was special. He always had a, one of the squeakers, you know, the little squeakers that we use to make kids smile. He always had one in his pocket. So (laughs) when I think of Victor, I think of squeak, squeak, sad story. He was a great photographer and an incredible worldwide teacher. And he died broke. We took a worldwide collection just to bury him. Mm. So the lesson in that for me and for others is be good at your craft and teach, but dang it, run your business well so that you're profitable. And (laughs) at least so that, so that people don't have to take a collection. (laughs) <laughs> to throw a party for you. So, yeah. All right. Are we ready for Mr. Chair's conversation? Oh, my. Always ready for Mr. Chair. <laughs> All right. So, uh, let's see. Let me hear you describe Mr. Chair's. First of all, why do we call him Mr. Chair's or Mr. Philip Chair's? Yeah. I mean, at least in my time when I was there, it was Mr. Chair's. Um, even in the presence of him and his wife, Marianne. Uh, Marianne would address him, Mr. Cheris, mm-hmm. uh, in front of us. Um, and he was Mr. Cheris. That was his name. Like, you're Lucy, I'm George. He was Mr. Cheris. Mm-hmm. Uh, amazing. Um, you know, I met him. I wasn't in a position, if I can start here, I wasn't in a position in 1995. I received an amazing mentorship piece of advertising from Alpha Color Lab, which was his lab. Mm-hmm. Uh, an opportunity to study with Mr. Cheris, and he was going to hand pick a couple people um, through some sample images that you would submit. 
And if he thought they were decent, he would reach out to you. And I, for whatever reason, I don't recall. Um, I had that brochure and I actually still have that brochure. Mm. That's how much it meant to me when I got it in the mail. But little did I know that six years later, he would call my studio and ask for me. I had no idea who, that he knew anything about me. And he met me or he learned about me, I should say, through Bill McIntosh. Ah. Bill was a great guy. And I mentioned that earlier. But something that I will always, always make me a little bit teary is that Bill reached out to Philip, Mr. Cheris, and said, you know, I've been working with this young guy for a while. And uh, in one of our conversations, he mentioned to me that he absolutely loves your studio work. So, you know, perhaps you need to meet him. And so anyway, he came to Washington, D.C. for a Ed Pierce um, photo vision, if you recall, back yeah. then it was, uh, he was doing uh -huh. those things. And, he, and he, so he did this live uh, over a clo uh, closed circuit or something of nature. Many cities were being viewed at the same time. And I was in the first row. I was watching the show. Um, the show ends. Everyone claps. We get up. I go up to him. I thank him. I said, this was really, really great. And I introduced my, I told him my name and he looks at me and he says, with his finger pointing to me, I'll never forget. And he says, you see that blonde haired woman sitting over there in the corner? That's my wife, Marianne. And she wants to talk to you. Mm. Lucy, I could have fallen over with a feather. Yeah. So I want to put a pin in that so people understand. Because we didn't kind of fill out who Mr. Cheris was. His work was very high end, classic portraiture, like the painters that he saw when he went to the Huntington Library in Pasadena. A uh, little side note, Mr. Cheris did my high school yearbooks before he suddenly rebranded himself. And I have this picture of him after he photographed a bunch of cheerleaders at the Huntington Library, uh, taking some time to walk the galleries in Huntington Library is this beautiful property that has like a palace with the most amazing art and the gardens are incredible. If you're ever in the LA area, you have to go. Anyway, I, ha I have a feeling he had this light bulb moment that was like, I don't want to be schlepping around photographing cheerleaders and bands and such. I want to do this kind of portraiture and charge really well for it. And so if you have a chance to look him up and there is a book that's beautiful that he did, it was fancy gowns, fancy furniture, beautiful crafted lighting, hand-painted backgrounds that people would purchase Let's say if the time at the time an eight by ten was fifty dollars, his eight by tens were seven hundred and fifty dollars. Like he just he just cleared the pack and created a whole other imagining of what we could do with our work at a time when you know photography people weren't doing a lot of great art. Okay, so this is his. You know he's like the top of the top of the heap both in his business skills and his work and he's teaching. Okay. So then he says to you, my wife over there wants to talk to you. And so why were you so gobsmacked? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I, you know, ultimately my highest level of my own work in my mind, which I had never produced was a Cheris like portrait. I mm. had aspired through 28 years of weddings two years of environmental portraiture with Bill McIntosh. But for me, if I could do absolutely the very best thing that I would enjoy doing would be doing in-studio work like Mr. Cheris. And mm -hmm. so for him even to know my name, I thought was just outrageous. But um, so anyway, I go over and I meet with Marianne. And, uh, you know, they, long story short, the two of them invited me to dinner that evening. We went out together. Um, he explained to me that he was very much in the market for an apprentice and felt that perhaps um, with the people that I have mentored under, that I could be a candidate. And so he invited me to California. And so I, I, it took about a month for me to get my ducks in a row from my studio because it was really, you know, I was surprised I had to have received that. But 
again, long story short, I did come out to California. I spent a week with him uh, three times in five weeks. Over a five-week period, I spent three weeks at his studio. Mm. Uh, and he taught me uh, one-on-one for several hours per day. And it was the most amazing thing. And one of the days, you, you mentioned the Huntington, and, and I could say, you know, absolutely. One of the days I will always remember in my life is that Mr. Cheris and Mrs. Cheris um, drove me over to the Huntington Museum. And we spent the day there like a seminar. And we walked through the, the room with the Romneys and the Reynolds and um, Gainsborough. Gainsborough's Singer Sergeant, yeah. Pink, Pinky and Blue Boy. Yeah. And folks, you know, if you're not familiar, I mean, these are paintings that are 14, 18 foot tall. You know, these are amazing size works of art that are extremely detailed. And Mr. Cheris aspired to do that type of work. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he apprenticed under Mr. Giddings. Um, yeah. and, and the story there was that, you know, he wanted to include more environment around his portraits. And Mr. Giddings suggested that he go to a eight by 10 camera with a split five by seven back. And when he did that, he, he talks about in his teachings that his whole world just opened up and that's mm. when things really changed for him. Um, and he was in a, in a, in a, um, a level of his own, if you will. And yes. It was incredible. Yes. I want to paint another visual picture. So Mr. Terrace, as you can imagine, was always perfectly put together. The, the probably, I don't know about men's shoes, but I'm sure they were the best, most beautiful shoes on a suits or, you know, maybe he wore a black turtleneck and black pants sometimes. His studio is just how you can imagine it. It was luxury, thick gold frames, oriental carpets, rich colors on the wall, um, you know, the branding, everything fit together when he went from being a high school yearbook studio to change his branding completely, like it was all in. And he was very confident. I loved his generosity and also his sense of self in that. So I just want people to, that's where the Mr. Cheris, that was part of his brand was yes. to be Mr. Philip Cheris or Mr. Cheris. And here he, he's been gone, could be 15 years maybe. Yes. And we're still, we're not calling him Phil. Anyway, yeah. so before we move on, I wanted to, I, I know you had something else you wanted to share. And then I want want you to tell us two of the most powerful lessons you learned. Because this is a program where I want people to not just hear stories, but get tips in their business. So on your market set, go. (laughs) Yes. And so, um, you know, again, with Mr. Cheris, just to to share, he was such a perfectionist in the camera room and with lighting. In his teachings, I remember one day I came in without knowing what was going to happen. And he sent me into his camera room with his secretary. And in, in his teachings, there's only five poses. You know, you have profile left, profile right, two-thirds left, two-thirds right, and straight on. Now, he'll change the light from left to right, which those five images will now give you 10 opportunities. And like most photographers, or even all photographers, we take click, 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 click. We take the picture. We go to the next. We have a whole bunch of photos to edit down. Mr. Cheris' teaching was you get one image, one click, one shot at that pose, you change the pose. So we would do 10 poses. And back then it was film. So you got uh, 120 back with 10 pieces of film, 10 Mm -hmm. images you had to shoot at a session. So you got one pose. And so you had to make it your very best. It was like a dart into the dartboard. Had to be perfect. Ah, Bullseye. And you had to practice this over and over and over again. And it was very, very um, disciplinary. It, It made me a so involved in understanding of detail of the hands and everything about the garment and the position of the face, all of that was just very, very important. And so I went in and I did this session. And then a couple of days later, the proofs came back and we critiqued it. And he was always a gentleman. He was always very nice. But during this session, I recall, he was very stern and very true about this is how you correct this. And sometimes 
Lucy, it was just a fraction of a little bit to move from here to there to get it just right, as if a portrait painter was painting it on a canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, that discipline taught me very well that in, in doing studio work or outdoor work, anytime you're behind the camera, you know, you really are in control of the whole image. And uh, it starts with the feet up, you know, a good portrait starts with the feet up and you just make, you make, you make art. And it's just, it, it was just amazing working with him. Yeah. So what do you mean starts with the feet up? It's almost like an anchor, if you will, your portrait should start with the feet. From the feet up. You're not, <laughs> I had this picture of people putting their feet up, which oh, I no. knew that's not what you were saying. <laughs> so you pose from the feet up. Yes. yes. Like, um, when I learned from all of these people we're talking about and more, I'm not sure who it was that was posing a bride and you couldn't see her feet, but they still taught us to pose the feet because then the body falls in place. And um, it's just a huge difference to, to have the weight on the back foot and relax the knee and point the other foot towards us or some, you know, some way to make S curves or C curves and all of those kinds of things. But yes, don't look at the face on down, start with posing those feet and it mm -hmm. makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the two things were craft your shot so that you could only take one and that one is going to be successful. So like, Slow down, pay attention, right? Yes, absolutely. Slow down was a big one. There was no hurry. Um, and oftentimes when I first started working with him or working for him, whatever, um, I was kind of fast, fast. Again, remember, I'm a 28-year wedding photographer where you're always flying by the seat of your pants. And again, I did have a number of years with Bill and some other things in between that when I was introduced to Mr. Chairs. But that's ingrained in you for all those years. And he right. was just like, slow it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going you're to create something now that is of a masterpiece quality. And so it's not going to happen quick. And even in my speech, when I was in the camera room, he, he, he taught me how to just slow down and talking. And also communicating with your hands, where you move your fingers almost like a, um, you know, a composer in an orchestra. Right. Uh, where you can orchestrate the head tilt and how to move everything was, it, it was just an amazing experience and yeah. it, it taught me well. And I have been able to, uh, I'm grateful to, to carry that on in my work now. Yes. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's still with us, that was a huge influence on me is Joyce Wilson. Do you know Joyce? Mm -hmm. I never met Joyce, but I do know of Joyce. She was on my bucket list to attend a, a, a seminar or something with uh, back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. but I never had a chance to meet her. No. So as everyone might be realizing when I've said it was pretty much a man's world when I started, uh, you've noticed <laughs> we haven't had like 50-50 like we would now. And Joyce was one of the few master craftsman photographers. She was one of the few teachers that were women that were doing, you know, week long schools and conventions and like all of the ways that I studied with the people that, that George and I are talking about. <laughs> so I took a week with her at West Coast School, which is um, it's still going on next June. You can come to San Diego and you can study with someone that is of the caliber of the people we're talking about that are many of them learned from the people we're talking about or from the people that they learn from because, you know, 40 years is a, is a big legacy. Anyway, so Joyce. So I always thought I had to like be perfectly poised and not make mistakes and Joyce's work at the time was a lot of children, high end, pretty good dollar amount, a lot of natural light. I don't like bringing lights outdoor if I can help it. And when she'd work, she'd get so excited that she'd trip over her, her tripod leg or drop a filter or, you know, Seeing her be imperfectly perfect was a huge lesson to me. 
because I had this standard and I don't know if it's true, but it seemed like the presentation that a lot of the dudes uh, brought when they were teaching was like having it all together. And Joyce was just like Joyce and laughed and yeah. So that was the one, one big lesson. The other is that um, she continued to do and explore fine art. And so she's also pretty well known in the art industry. Like she was one of the first that used 3200 speed, 35 millimeter film when we were all using Hasselblad's and medium format film. She was playing with really washed out, super grainy images of just women's curves and body parts. So watching the arc of her career, to me, um, she's just always pushing. She got into the Polaroid S670 movement that I became addicted to. Um, did you ever get an S670 camera, George, and and move the emulsion around and scan and, and those kinds of things? Did you ever play with that? Yeah, I did play with that for a little bit at one time. Um, yeah. I'm seeing her. Yeah. I, I didn't see her in person, but, you know, in, in uh, the videos and so on, you know, they had video. Um, uh, like today we have YouTube and, and computers, but back then, as you know, we had VHS tapes and things of that you would purchase. Right. Guys. Right. And Joyce taught that. So, and this was right before digital came out as we all started rediscovering this camera Polaroid camera from the early seventies when the emulsion was still soft and you could push it around and get painter. Anyway, she was always like, what's next, what's new, what's created. The third thing I learned from her is we went to a shoot at a home during this class. And at the time I was always quite interested in going to the after parties, as you might imagine and there were boys there and there were photographers and there was food and there was alcohol. And I just wanted to have the, you know, go to this session that she was teaching and then get on with it to the party. And at the point where I thought she was done is when she really started working. Mm -hmm. And I was angry that frustrated that she was still going and going and going and posing and finding other things. Now that was the best thing that ever happened to me because that's how I work is if I'm doing an outdoor, I do the things I get them in the can that I know if I don't get anything else, this will sell, they will love it. But now that I've got that, what else can I do? Mm -hmm. And she always talks about one for me and one for thee. So she does the images that the client is going to want that she knows. And then she puts on her artist hat and, you know, is coming up with other things. So she was my biggest influence early on. Oh, well, this was fun, 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 fun. Oh, we wanted to get into this a little bit and maybe you can touch on it. You know, we're getting short on time, but one of your big influences was Jim Rohn. Now, I need to study Jim Rohn because when I'm searching for quotes, George, for the start of my show, I keep running into the most amazing quotes by him. So you had an experience that kind of rocked your world. And I'm just imagining that Jim Rohn was a part of some of your personal growth. Am I right in that it was all connected? So you want to, I'd love to hear a little about this. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Jim Rohn was um, by far um, as much of an inspiration to me as, as any of these other folks that we talk about, and in many ways, much more so. You know, Jim was not a photographer. He was a personal development teacher and coach. And I was only in business about a year after I came back to Maryland uh, from being with Monty. And I, by accident, saw this small little newspaper ad on my uh, front lawn in a little TV magazine about a Jim Rohn workshop down in D.C. 
you know, I, I was just feeling like I needed to kickstart myself. Um, and, you know, what can I do? And this was this motivational speaker, speaker, excuse me, never heard of him, anything like that. And so I go, I go to the seminar um, down in D.C. And I'll tell you, within the first three minutes, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend for all of you um, who do not know the name Jim Rohn and you spell his last name R-O-H-N, please look him up. Um, unfortunately, he passed back in 2009, but all of his information is online and he continues to inspire to this day and for many more generations. Um, anyway, I did attend that seminar. I was hooked. I had the wonderful experience of a year later in September of 2002 to photograph him. Mm. I did. I, I was hired. Um, I mean, he was such a buzz to me. I mean, one of the things he taught me three minutes into the seminar, Lucy, he says to us, okay, he's throwing out quotes. The guy has a million quotes and he throws out a quote that says, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Mm. Knock me out of my chair. For some of you that may not be so inspiring, but to me, it lit me on fire. I thought to myself, my gosh, isn't that something? I just came out of working for almost a year with an icon. And to me, that was going to be the answer to where I wanted to go when really I need to work on myself and, and my personal development. And mm. he, he began, he's, he's the gentleman who was responsible or the person that was responsible for me to even seek out a Bill McIntosh or Mr. Chairs, or the other things that I did, because I could have been very happy to just stay at my 150 weddings a year, do my work, you know, make some money and be a photographer. But I always felt when I heard work harder on yourself than you do on your job, it, I, it, I adopted that into my every morning ritual of when I, after I'd wake up in my 10 minutes of prayer and getting my head together, what am I going to do today that I have to stretch for? Mm. So he was really, really great. Many, many quotes from him. You can just look them up. They go on and on. But right. um, Jim Rome was awesome. So I got a chance to photograph him. I met him. I spent some time with him behind the curtain, if you will, of the stage before the seminar. And uh, super, super nice guy. They offered me a very handsome compensation for the portraits. And I had asked them, I said, well, you know, if it would be agreeable to you, I would prefer to have a copy of all of his cassette tapes. Back then it was audio cassette tapes and he had, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 different six cassette tape programs mm. about all sorts of different things in life and how you can take yourself to where you want to be and just be a better person. And they traded me all of that material. And I still have the cassettes. Uh, I have moved them on to digital, but I still have those original cassettes. Mm. And I have the portrait session as well on House of Blood, you know, uh, 120 film that we did, too. That's awesome. Uh, but, yeah, very, very cool. Jim Rohn was really amazing. Yes. Uh, so I I love that that quote, the work harder on yourself than you do on your job. I've mentioned this a lot in the podcast that I think, for me, anyway, the beauty of entrepreneurship is how it's like an amazing personal growth class that whatever our, our challenges and our strengths are going to pop up as we're continuing to grow. And if we overcome or improve on them, then our personal life is also better. Like for me, conquering fear. I don't know why fear was such a big thing in my family, but um, just even fear like of, um, I don't know, physical harm from trying something adventurous. And it was a lot easier, or learning to say no, it was a lot easier to learn to set boundaries in my work than in my personal life. But once I learned how to do that, then I could take it into my personal life. So um, yeah, I'm going to put Jim on my list of people to study. So, well, yeah. George, I'm so excited that somehow we connected. I, I don't know if you were joining my private group, which everybody, if you're not in the Profitable Photographer private group, please join us. And then we got to Facebook chatting and now here we are. What I'm hoping is that people are not just hearing, you know, two people that have been around a long time talk about the good old days, but that you're learning 
from the people that we learned from that, um, you know, you're getting inspiration. And I recommend that everybody start attending conventions and local and state events and take week-long classes with the leaders of today and, you know, get mentors and people that you're going to look back on and say, this person had a huge influence on me, like George Allen, because George, you do teach and mentor and such, right? Yes, I do. I currently do it just locally, um, and I probably will continue to do that. Um, I, I have a couple ventures that are coming down uh, the pike here soon. Within the next few months, I'll be able to unveil them as far as coaching and mentoring. I do have a couple young studios that um, I help currently here in my area. Um, So yes. So if someone was like, I want to hang out with George for a while, they could, you could probably put something together. They could come visit you and you could work with them for a time? Absolutely. I mean, um, your story with Don Blair was very interesting. I mean, if someone were to come and I wouldn't necessarily say knock on my door, but give me a call, send me an email. I, I'd love to chat, love to talk. I have no secrets. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd love to tell you about, uh, you know, what we've learned in our time. I say, you know, when we commanded the ship kind of thing and it's time to pass it on. Yeah. Okay. So two quick questions. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Is question one. Best way is probably through email. Um, um, and my email is geophoto, G E O P H O T O, number 99 at gmail.com. Okay. And what would your parting thoughts be that you'd like people to take away from this? Like, what's your last word? Well, last word, I guess, Lucy, it's interesting. I actually have two, if I may, but. First, last word would be, you know, there are a number of professionals, Lucy, myself, others that have been in this industry for decades and look to us, come to us. You can learn so, so much. The gentlemen, um, and again, you know, they were men at that time, but the people that I mentored under, they completely changed my life. They made my life so much more enjoyable with my camera and, and my and the industry that I'm in. So mentoring, find a coach, find someone who's been in business 20 plus years and, and just work with them. Yeah, very, very important. Okay. Lastly, I think if I may add one more thing, I, I would like to conclude with a quote from Jim Rohn. Okay. Um, and, you know, Jim has another quote that I find very, very interesting um, and very, very good. And he says, you know, one of the greatest gifts you can give to anyone is the gift of your attention. Mm. And so, Lucy, I want to reach out to you and say thank you for inviting me to your show. I listen to your podcast and I'm thrilled to be a part of it today. And to all your listeners who have taken an hour of your time to listen to us chat about the good old days. So thank you. Thank you, George. I just love the serendipity about how we connected and then started talking about Mr. Cheris. And then it was like, I think this could be a really fun conversation. And as for me, I think it was a really fun conversation. And I wish you lived nearby so we could hang out. I now honestly feel like you're on my friend list of people that, you know, hope maybe you'll go to PPA convention or something and yeah absolutely or come visit San Diego or sure well I can oh. do that too I've been to California a few times have not yet ventured to San Diego but it's not as you've seen in my in my bio there it's not beyond me jumping on an airplane and, and coming to meet you yeah yeah so, uh, I'd love to do that all that time in Pasadena and you didn't didn't just go down the freeway a couple hours. <laughs> Capistrano was my home there for a while. <laughs> yeah, that's just an hour when the yeah. traffic's right. Beautiful. All righty. Well, I'm going to invite everyone to hang tight and I'll do the wrap up as best I can. So, George, this has been so much fun. And I feel like this is going to be a favorite episode, at least for me, but hopefully for my listeners around the world. So, thanks, thanks, thanks. And thank you. Well, now that I've said goodbye to George, I want to remind you to go to lucydumascoaching.com. You can learn more about my uh, group coaching, or if you're interested in one-on-one, I'm happy to have you book a 20-minute chat and uh, you know, 
just answer some questions, give you support on, you know, if you want to talk about pricing or have me look at your website, I'm happy to do that. So my hope is that you gain some inspiration from the wisdom of these photographers that we mentioned. And so I'm going to do a quick rundown. You want to check out Monty Zucker, M-O-N-T-E, and what George learned was about the, well, there's so much to learn from Monty, but posing, lighting, growing a business with weddings by having affiliates with vendors and going for excellence. He shared about Jim Rohn, R-O-H-N, who I'm going to start checking out some videos and audios from him. He was very inspirational in the personal growth area. We talked about Bill McIntosh, and he learned about the importance with every session of composition, color harmony, design, and reading the light. We talked a lot about Mr. Philip Cheris, who had a very strong brand, taught him about how to do a full session with only 10 images. And those 10, I'm sure, sold for many, many thousands per client. So quality over quantity. I talked about Don Blair and his generosity and making everybody feel important. Victor Avila, who I forgot to mention, his trademark phrase is simplicity breeds excellence. And then my experience with Joyce Wilson, and I learned the value of pushing myself to do more than what's expected, and also seeing her not be uh, perfect, but drop things and, you know, just be human. That was powerful. So stay in touch, have a great, great uh, month, whatever month it is for you as you're listening to this. And until next time, bye. You have been listening to The Highly Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share. To connect one-on-one and learn more about our coaching programs, just go to lucydumascoaching.com. Until next time, go have fun photographing and selling your work.